Now what you will notice on here is that we have labelled these two orbitals, which I've given names to, it's dx squared minus y squared and dz squared, those are collectively the eg orbitals. Now what does this eg bit? Well, it's a label that we use. The e, believe it or not, stands for doubly degenerate. So you have two um, orbitals of the same energy, these orbitals are doubly degenerate, and that, for reasons I don't understand, is given the letter E. We'll see in a minute how silly this is when we get to triply degenerate. Okay, so this is E. What does the G label mean? The G stands for the German word Gerada, and essentially what it means here is that we have inversion symmetry. So if you look at an octahedral arrangement, an octahedral arrangement of ligands has inversion symmetry. If we take a ligand here and invert it through the centre, you find a ligand in the opposite position. So an octahedral arrangement of ligands has inversion symmetry, and so we can use the label G. So these are known as the EG set, and it's dx squared minus y squared and dz squared. Now, here we have three orbitals, so they're triply degenerate. And if they're triply degenerate, we use the letter T. Now, if you draw an entire molecular orbital scheme, this is not the first set of triply degenerate orbitals, so these are always given the letter T2. The 2 just refers to the fact that this is the second set of triply degenerate orbitals in the whole molecular orbital scheme, and I'm not going to draw that. I'm only interested in the bit in the middle where the D electrons go. Okay, now this still has a G label because these have also got, obviously, inversion symmetry in this system. Okay, so what you have is a octahedral, this is known as an octahedral <coughs> splitting diagram. So we have an octahedral splitting diagram, and in that octahedral splitting diagram, we can start to feed electrons, and we'll feed electrons in. Now, in an octahedral system, it's quite easy to envisage the splittings because in an octahedral system, conveniently, the ligands fit along the axes. Now, some of you may say, well, why have you got the ligands <coughs> on the axes? Why don't you put the ligands somewhere else? The only effect that will have, it won't change the splitting in energies of these systems, it will just make your mass more complicated. So by convention, the ligands are coming al along the axes, and it's a very convenient convention to use because it vastly simplifies the way we do this. OK, so that's the splitting diagram for a tetrahedral arrangement of ligands. Now this time, you'll notice a few subtle differences in the labelling of this diagram. First of all, this separation between the uh, orbitals here, the dx squared minus y squared and the z orbitals, dz squared orbitals, which are now the lowest energy orbitals, and the highest energy orbitals is not labelled delta O. Students often label it delta O because they get into the habit of doing it. It's delta T because we're now dealing with a tetrahedral ligand field. We're not dealing with an octahedral ligand field. You'll also notice that in order to conserve energy, it's now three-fifths down to two orbitals and two-fifths up to three orbitals. That's required, clearly, in order to conserve the energy of these systems. The other thing that you will notice is that this is now the T2. So it's still triply degenerate, but these are the T2 orbitals, and these are the E orbitals. In a tetrahedral field, if you have a tetrahedral arrangement of ligands, there's no inversion symmetry. So if you have a tetrahedral arrangement of ligands, there's no inversion symmetry. So another trap that students tend to fall into is to label it always, it's always T2G, it's always EG. Remember what the G stands for. It's referring to the fact that you can have inversion symmetry that doesn't apply in a tetrahedral environment, and so we don't have it.